Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is David Sandelow. I am the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia. I'm also the co-director of the Energy and Environment Concentration here at the School of International Public Affairs. We're really thrilled to welcome a uh, tremendous guest tonight. Bef before I introduce him, um, just a few program notes. First, um, uh, after he speaks, we will have question and answer session. For those of you watching online, and we always have lots of them, uh, you can ask questions as well. You can do it by Twitter at hashtag CGEP events. That's Center on Global Energy Policy events. So hashtag CGEP events for asking questions for anyone online. Uh, please follow us on Twitter at, uh, at Columbia U Energy, at Columbia U Energy. Um, this is one of a series of events that we are doing this fall. Um, uh, I want to thank our program, our director of programs, Julie Mourinho, who uh, does such a great job of pulling these together and organizing them for us. Just a few words about events coming up on Friday. We're welcoming uh, Hemi Bahar of the, of the International Energy Agency for a discussion of the IEA's Renewable Energy Market Report. That's Friday morning, um, 9.30. Um, uh, next Wednesday, October 18th at 9.30, right in this room, we have a discussion uh, on the Iran nuclear deal, uh, decertifying the Iran nuclear deal, which President Trump is expected to do tomorrow, and we'll have an analysis of that. Um, on October 30, we're welcoming Chairman Liu Zhenya, former chairman of the China State Grid, um, to talk about clean energy and electric energy interconnection. And please go to our website for more. Uh, we're particularly thrilled to welcome tonight uh, Minister Ibrahim Bailan, uh, the Swedish Energy of Minister and Policy Coordination. Um, Minister Bailan has a uh, long and distinguished career in, in public service in Sweden. He studied economics at Umeå University, then he served as a member of the Swedish Reichstag since 2006, as a member of the Social Democratic Party. Um, he keeps on getting promoted, he can't keep a, jo can't keep a job. Um, he uh, was Minister of Schools from 2004 to 2006, then Chair of the Committee on Transportation and Communications, then Deputy Chair of the Committee on Education, then Minister for Energy starting in 2014, and then starting last year took on the additional role of Minister for Policy Coordination. His leadership um, abilities have been recognized internationally as well. He, he is going to chair the International Energy Agency's biannual ministerial, which is coming up um, next month, I guess. Um, uh, Minister, welcome to Columbia. Look forward to your remarks, and then we'll have question and answer. Thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity. It's, it's obviously an honor. And uh, during these interesting times, both in the energy sector, but also politically, of course, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I will start with a small presentation, and then I will go on with some of our, some of the Swedish experiences when it comes to climate and, and, and energy, because energy is obviously at the center of any uh, serious climate discussion. My name is, uh, as mentioned, Ibrahim Bailan. Uh, I've been, uh, well, every, I have to confess, every time somebody presents me as Minister for Energy, I, I, I get a bit surprised because Thinking about where I started and becoming then Minister for Energy in Sweden uh, is still something that I have, I have problems to cope with. Because, you know, I'm born very far from Sweden. I'm born uh, in a different parts, per part of the world. Uh, this is the place where I was born. Well, at least it would have like looked like this. Uh, <laughs> at night from the air compared from where we are today. A picture from air at night looks like this. The difference is obviously that where I'm born, we didn't have access to modern electricity or energy. I'm born in a small village, rural village in the southeast of Turkey near the border of Syria and Iraq and lived there for 10 years. Um, after 10 years, we had a very difficult situation. Uh, we had a military coup in, in, in Turkey in the beginning of the 1980s, and at the time, my parents decided that we should move on because they couldn't see any future, any good future for uh, their children. Uh, at the time, we were four siblings. 
So we went uh, ahead and, and, and moved to Sweden. Uh, I must confess, at the time, I didn't understand how difficult that was for my parents, because from my point of view, it was a very exciting uh, journey. Going from a rural area in, in southeast of Turkey, where we lived, like you were living here in the 19th century, going to what was already then one of the most, most modern places on earth, Sweden. It was obviously very, very exciting. I mean, just uh, we, we, we moved to Sweden midwinter, and who, I, I don't know if anybody has been to Sweden, but it's, it could be quite cold in Sweden midwinter. But inside it was very comfortable, obviously. You needed some light, you just got it whenever you wished. And my favorite, if you want to take a shower or a bath, you could do it whenever you want. And you could have the perfect mix of hot and cold water. It obviously not, not something you, you would think about in a modern society today, but we came from a situation where we uh, fetched water from a well on a Saturday, always on Saturdays, because we went to church on Sunday, of course. We, we needed to be clean then. And then um, you heated up the, the water. And if you are one of the first into the water, it was too hot. One of the last, it was too cold, obviously. And not so clean water, I would say. Coming to this country, to Sweden, it was like coming to paradise, from my point of view. This modern way of life is very comfortable, very, uh, very nice, I would say. But of obviously, this very, very successful way of building modern societies with huge industry output, very comfortable uh, uh, life for, for the citizens, high degree of liberty. You could go almost everywhere on the globe already then. That very successful way of building societies that we have been doing in the West for a very long time now has obviously its drawbacks. At the time in Sweden, it wasn't, as you might suspect, it wasn't climate change that was worrying. Sweden at the time built almost all of its success, all the, all of, almost all of its modernity on fossil fuels, in essence, oil. Sweden at the time was one of the world's most oil-dependent country. We used oil for heating purposes, obviously very important in our country. Transportation goes without saying, and even electricity sometimes. And uh, as you know, in the mid-70s we had an oil crisis, with the prices going up a lot. And being a very oil-dependent, open economy, that's not a good thing. So at the time, we began the transition to a different kind of energy systems. Comparing Sweden those days, we uh, introduced and uh, increased energy taxes so that it wasn't that cheap at the time, so that you, could, you, could, you should manage it more carefully. We introduced uh, carbon dioxide taxation, a carbon pricing in essence, 1991, one of the world's first. We uh, also, these days obviously, we have also an emission trading of, in, 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 the, uh, in the European Union. We introduced a green certificate system to support the production of, uh, of uh, uh, renewable electricity. We had co governmental campaigns to inform about energy efficiency, what you could do, education, obviously, and also, also invested heavily in innovation and in R&D in the clean tech area. And we had also uh, special governmental programs and grants for the local, the municipalities and the households to, to support uh, the transition. The result, 30 plus years later, is something like this. The decoupling of growth from uh, emissions and, uh, and uh, the use of energy. Sweden today, compared with the country that I came to in the mid-80s, is a country where the GDP has doubled 
in real terms. Around 90, 95% rise in GDP. Industry output has risen by approximately 200%. The population has increased by 25%. Eight to 10 millions, not like the US. At the same time, we are using less energy and less electricity than we did in the mid-80s. So I would say, and at the time, of course, when we introduced a lot of the policies, we had obviously the same debate that you have in the US today. Environment, climate versus jobs and growth. Will it hamper our competitiveness? Will it destroy our competitiveness? Will it destroy jobs? Will, be, will we be able to increase our growth? And that was obviously a logical discussion, logical debate, because until then, every forecast for energy use was about increase. Eight, the, the, I think the projections in the 70s was that we needed to increase our energy production with additional 8% every year. So obviously we built a lot of nuclear plants in the 70s and the beginning and mid 80s. But I would say that our experience today is that, uh, is that uh, it's not only possible to increase your growth, it's not only possible to increase the amount of jobs you, in your, you have in your economy, I would say, even say that to make, to make this transition from a fossil fuel-based economy to a more sustainable economy is the requirement for sustainable growth and new jobs in, for, for, for mature economies. That is our experience. That, we are, that is what we have seen when we have pushed for these policies from the beginning to become more independent on on foreign oil or on, on, on oil from, from the Middle East. So we are pushing ahead. We have set, the government has set the target to make Sweden the first, the world's first fossil free welfare society. Because it's not, I mean, it's not no, it's no challenge to make, to make a society well, uh, fossil free. Uh, the village where I lived was fossil free but also to make it, to combine it with being a welfare society with high ambitions on, social, on, the, on the social agenda, of course. We'll do it by uh, use, I've set new targets for energy efficiency. As I told you, compared with the mid 80s, our economy is much more efficient today, but we will keep pushing it at 50% is a new target for making, uh, use our energy more efficiently. By 2040, you have agreed broadly in the political system, in the parliament, to make our electric sector, energy sector, 100% uh, renewable. And by, 20, by 2045, we will not have any uh, net emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, followed by negative emissions. Now you might ask, well, that's good, well, good and well for a small country up in the north, but is this possible to do these days? Because still, we have more people today without access to electricity than we had when ele electricity was invented on an industrial scale. 1.2 billion people lacks today still electricity or energy, modern energy. Is it possible then? Well. I would say that it is uh, because I th it is because the sun is shining. Oh, I would say on our globe, but most of our globe, uh, we tend to lack the sun. We, we tend to miss the sun during winter time in Sweden. I will show you this picture from a, an upcoming IEA report that I think will be published next week. This is a projection what you would need to do to make. To, to give uh, access to electricity, electricity access in sub-Saharan Africa between the year 2017 to 2030. We already have the technologies. We already have the solutions to, to make it, 
to make it possible for every human being in sub-Saharan Africa to have electricity and doing it by even reducing greenhouse gases. Solar, obviously, that's why it's so important that the sun is shining. You all know of the development we have seen for solar power, for PVs, the recent five, ten years. Huge development there. Compared, solar power compared with when, with when I was born 45 years ago is 99% cheaper today. And that's not the end of it. I would say that it's only the beginning. The development now we have with smart grids, mini grids, micro grids, and so on. The large hydro resources that you have that has not been utilized. And even, as you see, even though you could utilize some coal, oil, and gas, it will still be better than the very primitive way of cooking and using biomass today. So I would say it is quite possible, and it will, uh, I think, with a good policy, be, we would be able to do it. How then? Well, I think one thing was very, very important to remember is that energy is not isolated from other challenges we are facing when it comes, to example, we, for example, the other challenges that we have when it comes to refugee crisis, so social agendas, and so on. I think if we have a holistic approach and try to meet the ch those challenges together, I think it will be more efficient and we will also manage it better. The other is about e uh, efficient energy policies and actions that, that makes the, these challenges becomes opportunity, become opportunities. We have a long history where we have tried to meet the challenges and, 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 and change them to opportunities. Um, one such example, just a small one, is how do you promote these kind of, of uh, uh, investments in, 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 in renewables, for example. There are different kind of policies, and our experience is that you can make it extremely efficient if you just do it right from the beginning. Our experience, our system has been very, very market-based, technologically neutral, and it has proven to be very, very efficient. I would also say that we need to, to have a much better cooperation when, when it comes to, to, to uh, uh, technology, because we have already the technology we need today. But of course, if we don't, do not cooperate, or if we do not share, then it won't be that, that, uh, that it, won't, it won't help. I would also raise another issue that I will also raise during the, the, the IEA ministerial in a month's time, and it's about gender equality in the energy sector. Sweden is known as one of the world's leading uh, countries when it comes to gender equality. Still, when as I was appointed Minister for Energy three years ago, I'd never worked with energy, I must confess. So I tried to be be very available to, to get to know people. So I was uh, accepting almost all invitations from the sector on seminars and panels and so on. And what hit me, the five first panels that I was participating in, that even in gender equal Sweden, it was almost, without an exception, always men on the scene. And why is that? I asked, actually I asked, oh, well, people didn't really want to discuss that because it was a bit embarrassing for, for, for Swedish society and the Swedish energy sector. But they were talking about, well, you know, traditionally we have been very, very heavy on, on engineers and, you know, engineers traditionally, are they are men. And okay, why is that? Is it about physical strength? I don't think so. I think this is a problem for the energy sector. It is a structural problem, it's a strategic problem, and I think that is also one of the reasons why traditionally the energy sector has been very, very much about huge power plants, be it coal or nuclear or other kind of power plants. I think the, the, how the, the, the energy discourse, how the energy strategies are, 
are impacted by the fact that we have very, very few women in the energy sector, at least in the leading, uh, leading, in leading the energy sector. Therefore, we'll also take an initiative to make the energy sector more gender equal, because I believe it's an important strategic choice for the energy sector. We have taken this initiative in Sweden. I will also take it uh, globally together with Fatih Birol, the executive direc director, and other colleagues from, from, from around the world. Because I think the energy sector will benefit. I think new technologies will benefit. And I think in, in the long run, our globe will benefit. Because without a solution to the challenges we have in the energy sector, there is no solution when it comes to climate change. 70% of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the world that have a man-made impact on our planet comes directly or indirectly from the use and utilization of energy. Therefore, we need to make this change. And I am totally convinced from the Swedish point of view that it is possible, it will be possible, and it will make our planet, it will make our economies, it will make uh, 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 it will be another step in humanity's development to make this transition. Our experience from Sweden is it's great for the jobs and it's great for economic growth. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for those inspiring remarks um, and for your inspiring story. Um, I, I thought I'd maybe just start with Sweden and then go to Europe and then go to the world. Um, and just, I'm curious, starting with what you were describing in Sweden, um, it's quite, that graph you showed is quite remarkable, how economic growth ex uh, was so strong and CO2 emissions declined. Could you just say a word about Sweden's energy mix? Um, do you have a lot of hydropower? Do you have a lot yeah. of wind power? Do you have a lot of nuclear power? How, do, how does that work? All of above. Okay. I think the Swedish, uh, uh, our largest source of energy today is, is, is uh, not what you would expect, but it, 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 it's actually bioenergy. Where we used to use a lot, lots and lots of oil or coal or gas, mostly oil and coal, uh, we, have, uh, we have now residuals from our forestry, from our pulp and paper industry, uh, waste. You know, all over the world, wherever I go, you see these huge piles of landfill waste. And in some countries, you could, you could literally see them smoke. And you just shudder because where is all this ga or all those gases going? Well, directly to the atmosphere, of course. And in countries like India, you could see mile after mile of these huge landfills just rotting there. In Sweden, I think we are now down under 1% of landfill. What is, we recycle what we can to energy, biogas, in essence, organic materials, or, or, or other uh, recycling uh, facilities. And what we cannot recycle, we send it to the heating sector, where we also wow. produce electricity. So bio, biomass, biofuels are, in, in, uh, by large, our largest share. And then it's hydropower, nuclear, uh, wind power and biomass for electrical uh, reasons. I think it's 15%. We are uh, we have around 120% of our need of electricity. So we obviously we are also an exporter of electricity to our neighbors. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the big challenges in decarbonization is in the transport sector. Yeah. What, what um, what's happening with electric vehicles in Sweden now? It's uh, I would say that. Even though that has proven to be, I must confess, one of the most difficult challenges to meet. Because even though Sweden today is, is, has the highest share of renewable fuels in the transport sector, it's still only around 20%. It's biofuels wow. and electricity. I think it has gone, as we, we, are, we are lagging a bit behind. We are trying to push it. The question at issue has been the chicken and the egg. Where do you start? You, you, you would need EVs to have the infrastructure, or do you need the infrastructure to, to be able to promote and to motivate your citizens to, to, to buy uh, electric vehicles? 
What we are doing today from the government, we are trying to do both. We try to support our citizens when they want to invest in what is uh, the sustainable solutions, be it EV or other, other, other kind of, of, of uh, sustainable vehicles. Or, and at the same time, we are also now rapidly building out the infrastructure for EVs, of course, but also other kinds of fuels. And I think this is what needs to be done, uh, because in the long run, uh, you cannot solve our, uh, the problem with being so oil dependent as you are if you cannot solve the problems in the, in, in the transport sector. And lastly, we have now a tremendous opportunity. Electrification is one, but also automation and uh, this is a word I always have difficulties with, digitalization. Was that right? Yeah. That is, how, yep, that's the, the English word. The combination of this makes it also much more, more uh, makes it possible to have transports that are much more efficient than we uh, have today. Because honestly, be it heavy duty vehicles or cars, most of the time they, they are, we, we make very unnecessary trips. And can you get, can you be much more efficient? Then that will also be a part of, of solving the problems in the transport sector. And by the way, this was the top, this is the topic of a Twitter question that we got. Um, it, it, the question asks, how crucial uh, are the role of advanced biofuels in the fossil fuel future uh, of Sweden? And, and, and you briefly mentioned this, but just could you expand on, on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think, uh, I mean, when, when we're talking about cars, I think they will become electric because electricity is such, so much more efficient than the combustion engine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's, that's going to happen. We're now investing heavily in infrastructure for it. And, and we're also trying to support our citizens when they're buying it with, with grants. But heavy duty vehicles, that's a different uh, story. Mm -hmm. So what we are trying to do is, is to try at the same time, we are trying to, to promote the, the electric, uh, the, the cars, electric cars. We also try now to push for uh, for uh, 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 the, the advancement of, of uh, advanced biofuels. How do we do that? We actually we are just introducing a new bill to the parliament, and I think it will pass with a huge majority, where we will uh, uh, we will uh, implement a quota system where we will. Uh, as we have done in the electric sector with the, with the green certificate system, we will introduce um, a bill that will demand of those selling uh, diesel or, or gasoline that they will reduce their, green, their greenhouse gases. And the target we have set is that by, by 2030, they will need to, 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 uh, to uh, reduce emissions by 70%. We don't tell them how to do it, but of obviously there is no, no, it's advanced biofuels that you are talking about. Mm -hmm. And that I think will, will, will be very good. What, what, like what makes you convinced about that? Well, the support has been huge, also in the industry. So I think it will be, uh, advanced biofuel will play a huge role when it comes to heavy duty, heavy duty vehicles in Sweden. I have a question on another topic. You, in addition to being Minister of Energy, you're Minister of Policy Coordination. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, to put it short, it mean, means everything that the Prime Minister wants me to do. And it usually is about problems. <laughs> so uh, the Prime Minister rarely really calls me and says, well, we have a very, very uh, funny thing to do. Would you want, like to do it? No, I, I, actually, it could be, it's all about the policy. It is uh, to help the prime minister with issues that are uh, that are uh, interdepartmental. Um, it could be, and we have obviously one of our main challenges in Swedish society is about integration, because Sweden has been re receiving refugees on a level that lacks comparison in any other OECD country for the last ten years. Obviously, that's a cha it's both an opportunity but also a challenge. And that is one of the one of the things that I have uh, I have got uh, to work with uh, together with my other colleagues in the government. Just an example. I have to say I'm especially interested in this because I once worked at our White House, and mm -hmm. and our one of the jobs of the White House staff in the United States is to mediate differences between different cabinet departments. And That's and there's nothing wrong with that happening. It happens all the time. They come from different perspectives, and then the White House coordinates it. Um, it, that's the type of thing you do? And then do you have a staff that's responsible for helping you with precisely that function? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes it's just 
You know, uh, as you know, if you've been in, into politics, you know that uh, especially ministers, they're all, always very mature and it's always very <laughs> deliberate and very Obviously. logical and so on. It would That's never be something immature happening between <laughs> colleagues, no. But if something yeah. like that should happen, hypothetically, hypothetically right. you it could never help happen with, here. You right. could help with that, yeah. Right. Or sometimes just telling people, quit, quit doing that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it, it, I'm curious. Sweden's part of the European Union, so uh, it broadening this conversation to what's happening in Europe right yeah. now. Um, e Europe has been promoting this idea of an energy union. Yeah. Um, what can you just talk about that and how you see that develop? Well, it actually started in the, uh, six, seven years ago, and it was it was a very special event. It was uh, the crisis, the gas crisis that we had. Not Sweden, but we have a couple of, uh, a lot of countries in the European Union being very dependent on gas. We have, have countries that have almost 100% of their energy mix from natural gas. And so obviously if you have one large provider that uses gas as a ge geopolitical mean, that was the discussion at the time, and it was obviously Russia that we are talking about, then that could create a problem. So uh, it was an initiative to make to diversify the gas supply to, to Europe. But since then, it has been, uh, the issue has become much larger. This is now about how to promote a more uh, streamlined energy policy in the European Union. How to cooperate with about in, in interconnections, obviously. Mm -hmm. Common uh, energy policy and common direction, I would say, uh, more or less. Uh, from our point of view, this is something that we are very supportive of uh, because we have, uh, as part of the energy union today, it's also about how to promote renewables, energy efficiency, how to promote more cooperation between, uh, between uh, the member countries. And one of, the, one of the main approaches is to promote regional co cooperation in the European Union. I think that's, that's very, very good because our own experience, we have been working with our neighbors in the Nordic countries and now more and more also with the Baltic countries, and it has proven to be very beneficial for all of us. It has created a win-win situation where we are use our strengths and weaknesses together and, 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 make, uh, and create an energy system that is very, very, uh, very, very efficient and also, I, uh, I would say, cost-effective for our customers, our, our citizens, our industries. And what, um, what's your government's view on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline related to that? Well, uh, me, uh, this is a debate going on, of course, obviously, because, uh, as I said, Sweden is not dependent on gas. We will not, we are not today. I think gas, natural gas is around two and a half, three percent of our energy mix, mostly for industries in the southeast of Sweden. We don't plan to be dependent on natural gas or any other fossil fuel for the future, as I mentioned earlier. So we are a bit skeptic, skeptic about uh, Europe building too much dependency or on, on fossil fuels, and in this case, gas. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a bit worried about this. So uh, just uh, this last summer, I, together with my Danish colleague, I wrote a letter to the, um, to the European Commission and uh, requesting their view on this and how this will play out with the objectives in the energy union and the, 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 the common, common framework that we have been working with. And uh, they are just seeking a mandate to look into this, and I think that's something good. Mm -hmm. um, even though we have great respect that every, every member country in the European Union, European union should uh, decide upon their own mix of energy, still, I think in the long run, what, what we promote together should be uh, sustainable, and I don't think uh, dependency on fossil fuels will be. Um, I want to ask you about the Paris Agreement, and obviously here in the United States where we have an odd set of circumstances. We have obviously a president who is with, says he's going to withdraw our federal government from the program. Meanwhile, it has prompted an incredible reaction in the United States. I mean, yeah. it, within a week of that happening, we had an organization called We Are Still In, which, in, which literally thousands of businesses, cities, and states said, President Trump may be out, but we're still in the Paris Agreement. Um, the pledges are enormous, and, and the polling data is very clear that a big majority of the United States disagrees yeah. with the president on this, but obviously he is still the president. Um, 
how, how did you see the situation with the Paris Agreement uh, going forward on a global level, and how does President Trump's statements, uh, how do President Trump's statements affect that? Well, to begin with, obviously a disappointment, though not so surprising because it was also part of the election campaign in, in the United States. And obviously, when you go into an election in, in a democracy, it should, it should matter. So from that point of view, it was, it was obvious going in that, that direction. But from our point, uh, obviously a, a, a disappointment. What, uh, and to put it this way, even if you do not believe in, in man-made climate change, uh, is there any danger to make your energy sector more sustainable? Mm. Your air cleaner, your, your water fresher? Well, you could obviously argue that well, it will be too costly, it will cost us jobs, and it will cost us economic growth. Well, our experience, and we have been doing this for a very long time now, not because of climate change, but because of costly oil at the time. Now we are more, much more, more uh, into, uh, we know that we, we have an ongoing climate change, uh, man-made, man, uh, we have had an impact on our, on our own planet, the only planet that we own. I don't believe you could, I mean, you could, let me give you an example. One, one of the, when I became minister for, for, for uh, energy in Sweden, for 40 years, we have had an ongoing deba debate about nuclear. We even had a referendum. Should we or should we not have nuclear in Sweden? And typically Swedish, we have three alternatives. Yes, no, or maybe. What do you think won in this referendum? <laughs> of course, maybe. So the, the, the fight just continued. But when I, I became Minister for Energy, I asked myself, does it matter? Does it matter if you're yes or no? Reality has moved on. Even if it's allowed to, be, to build new nuclear plants, will anybody build them? Well, every, the, it turned out there was a consensus that with less than the, the, the state supporting it with subsidies or guarantees, nobody in their right mind would put eight, eight to ten billion dollars into building a reactor, would produce electricity and sell it for one-fifth of what it cost you to, do, to, 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 to produce. And I think in this case it's the same. You could say that you, you, you're pro or against, but what is happening in reality? In reality, we have a fantastic development. In certain states in the United States, it's already like this. And, and all over the globe, you can see that where the sun is shining regularly, sun power, PVs, are the cheapest way already to produce electricity and energy. Will that change the coming decade? I, yeah, I don't think so. I think it will be only much more pronounced. So from our point of view, I think we will go on with the, with the climate change. I think it's, it's something to, needed to be done. And I think it will improve our economies and our job creation. Of course, you could, you could say, well, this is nothing, something for us. And that was obviously what, what was announced from, from the United States. But I, was, I would also highlight one thing that I don't think have been have been very, uh, very pronounced in the American debate. Did anybody follow suit? Good question. Yep. When did that happen the last time since the World War, World War II? That America pointed the direction and nobody followed suit. Very interesting. Just an ask, asking a question, Dipl diplomatically, as they are saying. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Yes, of course. Um, I have a few other questions, and then I want to I want to invite our audience to the microphone because I'm sure they have questions for you also. Um, Sweden has been involved in a diplomatic process called the Clean Energy Ministerial. Mm. Um, do you have any reflections on that and um, uh, the process and Sweden's role in it? Uh, 
I th uh, we uh, actually we are together with our Nordic Nordic uh, neighbors and the European Commission hosting the next next uh, clean energy ministerial. We are deeply involved in the clean uh, in the clean energy ministerial because we believe that the time that was a very good initiative uh, from the demonstration at the time, and I think uh, this will be needed especially when when it comes to promoting the right policies globally because there are a lot of good experience both good and bad experiences i would say uh, that need to be dispersed all over the world and i think this kind of cooperation is needed will be needed and we will try to push even further the, the cooperation and i'm very happy that this is something also that the ia is very involved in today and so i'm looking forward to uh, to to host it next year together with uh, with denmark yeah. And since we are chairing the also the Nordic Minister of Coun the Council of Ministers, we'll also chair the next Clean Energy Ministerial. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, please, if you have a question for the minister, come come to the microphone. Um, and, and while anybody does that, let me ask you about the IEA Ministerial, um, which you are going to be chairing, as I mentioned. Um, can you tell us what are your what are your thoughts about the IEA in general as an organization at this point? It's uh, some people call it out of date. It comes from the 1970s and its structure is uh, built around the political realities of the 1970s. What are your thoughts about the International Energy Agency? Well, I mean that could very well become reality if the IEA does not uh, update itself. And I think uh, what uh, the current uh, executive director has uh, been doing is just the right thing, trying to broaden the appeal of the, the, the IEA, both by geographically broaden, broaden the, the participation. I think uh, countries like China, India, Mexico, Brazil, and other countries uh, where you see a lot of uh, things happening, a huge increase in, in, in energy consumption, where uh, I would say that if we, if we don't look out from Europe and the United States, a lot of the standards for the future en energy system will be set, especially in China and India, where they're making huge investments in smart grids and renewable energy and, and different schemes for, for, for energy efficiency and so on. So to have them in the IEA in, in one way or another, I think it's, it's essential. And I'm very happy that uh, exactly what is happening now. Hopefully, Mexico will become even a, a partner, a member of, of the IEA now in a couple of weeks' time. And other, other countries becoming associate, associate members uh, or associate partners. That one. The other is, I think, it's also quite right to broaden the, the policy uh, uh, approach, I mean, bringing in, having much more focus on energy efficiency is quite the right thing to do. Uh, renewable energy, of obviously, the, 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 the things that have been happening in the last recent years, I think it's the right thing to do. Otherwise, if you wouldn't do th this, uh, it, there is a, a, a chance or risk that this, uh, the, the, the outdated theory would be a reality. Uh, because IEA was uh, founded during uh, the oil crisis, and, uh, and mm -hmm. you know, the world has moved on since then. If the IEA doesn't move on, it will become part of history. That's that's a very. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm very happy that the IEA is moving on, and it will play a, a, a important role. And I think that's that's something good. As I mentioned, we're welcoming uh, IEA leadership here on Friday of this week to talk about the uh, their renewable energy report and, and their. IEA does very good analytic work across a range of different topics, so we're, we're delighted by that. Um, this crowd is, is more shy than usual. Again, if you have any questions, please come to the microphone. Um, I wondered, you're here traveling in the United States. Um, have you, what other travels have you done in your role as minister recently, and any reflections on, on the trip you've taken? Well, I have been traveling a lot, uh, much more than I would have exp uh, expected or suspected when I was uh, promoted, uh, appointed Minister for Energy. I've been to countries like uh, Iran, Turkey, Indonesia, mm. India, China, obviously, uh, and a lot of other countries uh, in the European uh, uh, Great Britain and so on. 
And there are so many things happening at the moment in the energy sector. Mm. A lot of exciting, but also sometimes frightening things happening. Because at the same time, uh, when you have um, good things happening, investments in solar power or energy efficiency or wind power, storage of different kinds, you also see that the economic growth is still too much fueled by coal. And we know now, I mean, 100 years ago they could say that, well, we didn't know what we did. But today we know what we are doing. And we know that the planet will be, keep on being here, even without human beings. So it's about us, essentially. It's not about the planet. So I think if we are to save the planet for our children and grandchildren and then humanity in the future, we have to do something about that. So I think, see, both these things happening. What is very encouraging is that it seems that uh, the renewable sector is, is getting the better of the, the traditional fossil-based uh, sector. Mm. And that's something very, very encouraging, even in countries like India, where huge countries, obviously. I want to follow up a little bit on, on your answer there, but I, I see we have some questions. So okay. please identify yourself. and. Ask question to the minister. Uh, thank you so much for a very informative talk, sir. Uh, my name is Maham Masood Sadiq, and I'm from Lahore, Pakistan, and I'm a student of, um, of sustainability management at Columbia. My question is regarding the leapfrog that's expected within countries that don't have access to electricity. For instance, Pakistan has 37% mm. of its population without it, and India has a sizable chunk as well. So when we talk about the leapfrog within energy and decentralized energy, there's also this other aspect of China giving away its used coal power plants to Pakistan and to other countries and going towards the greener trend themselves. So mm. how do you see that trend happening and, and countries that, that are in need of cheaper energy kind of relying on allies and taking in their used fossil fuel plants? And then we, we also talk about the leapfrog aspect as well. So how do you see that kind of balancing out? Thank you for a very interesting uh, question. Five years ago, I was very, very worried about it. Five years ago, I was very, very worried about it. But today, I'm not as worried because I think one, one, the only reason why you would use uh, used, used, used uh, power plants or new power plants that are fossil-based is because they produce cheap energy. But I don't, I don't think that will be the case. Uh, and it's, it's going so tremendously fast. Look, I will give you an example. I, when we made, a, uh, uh, as I uh, told you, uh, uh, a broad energy agreement in Sweden uh, last year, one part of the, of the agreement is about offshore wind. And I got the question, how do you, th how do you see the investments developing in, in Sweden? Uh, well, without subsidies, I said, I don't, I don't see any coming until the 2030, maybe, because even though we have a long shore. You know what happened this year? <laughs> that was last year. You know what happened this year? We had the first tender being done for offshore wind without subsidies. Mm -hmm. I suspected last year that it would take 10 years, maybe. It happened this year. It was the first one. It will not be the last one. And so this is happening very, very fast. So I'm, I'm more and more convinced that with the right kind of, 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 of support, financing, because financing obviously a big uh, challenge in countries like Pakistan and in India and other parts of, of the world. And technology sharing, I'm, not, I'm seeing leapfrogging more than used uh, oil or, uh, or coal power plants being distributed all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sally. Um, I'm planning on studying environmental engineering. Um, and my question is about um, like the tension between like jobs and um, like things that are better for the environment. Um, in America, I've heard one of the main arguments against um, like closing down coal plants and stuff like that is that the jobs that are created are in different places from where the coal plants are, um, or not uh, like mining and stuff. Um, so like, have you had that problem in Sweden? Like. Um, or like how, like, is there a way to create jobs like in the same places to replace the previous jobs? Thank you. Thank you. Great it's question. Very great question, and uh, also one of the main challenges I would say that we have. 
all over uh, all over the world. Well, look, people have been able and have been uh, moving since the industrial age started. Uh, so there is no guarantee today, especially with the rapid development that we have, that you, the job that you had or your parents had will be there in five years' time. Uh, and I don't think that you could either promote or hinder this development by energy policies. I think what you need in a society uh, is to ask you, what can we do to help the people who become jobless because the, develop the technological development goes on, be it automation or in this case uh, the promotion of renewable energy, how can we get them with us on board the train and not left behind? Because if they are left behind, then you will get the, 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 the kind of, of worry and pessimism and also uh, uh, fear that we are seeing today in the Western democracies. I mean, we see it, we've seen it in Europe where right-wing extremes are, are, are on the move again. Mm. How do you do that? Well, what we have been doing in Sweden is two things. One, have a strong social security system so that when you need to go from a job to the other, you will not become homeless. You will not be worried about, can you provide your, your, your children with food and, and, and so on. The other is to provide edu vocational training, uh, education, to, because even though jobs are lost all the time, there are also new jobs created. And to make your people, uh, population, embrace change, they need to see that there is a bridge that will uh, bridge the, the gap that, that is created. So I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that this is possible, but you uh, cannot approach this challenge by saying nothing will change. We tried that. In the 70s, Sweden had a huge shipping industry. So when they were challenged from other countries, our first reaction was, we will defend it. We sent billions after billions into support and subsidies and you know what happened? Didn't help, obviously. Well, we are building still ships uh, or boats in Sweden, but that's luxury boats, something totally different. It was still lost and we lost lots and lots of money on that. And I think our approach is to, to, to embrace change, but do it in a way that helps people, not trying to hold on to technologies that are outdated. History is full of example of failures when you try to do that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here, Mr. Bailon. Um, my name is Jesse Thorson, and I'm an undergraduate in the Sustainable Development Program at the Earth Institute. Since the beginning of the year, I've been researching electricity access in Nicaragua mm -hmm. and specific socio-political barriers to electrification. Your slide on the EIA's projected electrification in sub-Saharan Africa. I think the end of the timeline was 2030. Yeah. What's the importance of good regulation of the energy sectors in Africa for the importance of realizing those goals by 2030? I would say that one of the main challenge that we have is not about energy policy. It's about corruption. I mean, sound, uh, I mean, we, we have uh, Sweden mm -hmm. obviously supporting uh, Power Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time has been investing hu heavily on trying to provide uh, people in sub-Saharan Africa with electricity. And the main challenge is not providing people, but how do you keep it and how do you keep the system sound? And I think that is one of the main challenges. Looking at the technologies, needed, looking at the money needed, I think it's quite manageable. But how do you do it in an environment that is so infested by corruption? That is, I think that would be the, the, the main challenge, not, not your energy policy. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Minister. Uh, my name is Jacqueline. I am a first year MPA student, energy and environment concentration. Um, you touched briefly on biofuels, and what I'd be interested in finding, finding out is that 
biofuels are often like uh, marketed as a more sustainable uh, alternative to fossil fuels. Um, but oil palm is a huge component of that as well. And what I would be afraid to, to well, what I want to ask is that by using these biofuels, are you not then um, taking or you're transferring your carbon emissions from your country to actually the tropics and, and, in, and in Africa at the same time? Excellent question. <laughs> exactly the debate that we have in the European Union just today and exactly the same debate that we have in Sweden today. That could be the case if you do, if you do not know what you are doing. But we have strict regulations on how we do this. Uh, obviously, we see that the, de the development will be in the country and not importing huge amounts of, 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 of uh, palm oil or, or palm base or, or, uh, or products based on palm, palm oil. Uh, how do you do that? You, well, you have to have a life cycle anal analysis. So everything you do from the forestry to uh, the production of the biofuels has to be strictly regulated and sustainable. Otherwise, it shouldn't be used. And that is exactly what we are trying to do. Um, and what I'm seeing from our point of view, I mean, Sweden has been using a huge amount of bio, bio, uh, biomass. Uh, we are this is our largest source. Still, we have 80% more forests today in Sweden than we had 100 years ago. Because there is a strict regulation there. If you cut down a tree to use in the pulp and paper industry or in the timber industry and use the residuals in the energy sector, you have to plant two new trees. And doing it in such a way, I, I think it's possible to have sustainable uh, 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 biofuels. And that's exactly what we are doing. We have obviously bad, bad experiences from the ethanol revolution uh, a decade ago. And I think we have learned a lot from that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Looks like we have another. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Sasha Cohen. I am a sustainability consultant. I'm not a student at Columbia, but I've taken advantage of many events and participated in them here. Um, I was very intrigued by your statement about women's involvement in the energy sector and being on panels um, and, and perhaps what you've seen in your time as right. minister of prior uh, positions. But I was particularly piqued because you made a comparison, at least this is what my takeaway, you, you made a statement like you think big coal plants and big power plants were built because men were in charge in these industries. And I, I would, it's kind of top of mind given some news stories recently, but I, I don't, I would hate for someone to follow gender stereotypes, but I, I was also very curious your thinking by, behind making that statement and then implying that if women were more present in the field that perhaps that wouldn't be the case or there would be alternatives to those types of footprints. Well, actually, my statement was that I think the debate has been too much about this. And I think one of the reasons is that it has been uh, almost mostly men traditionally in the energy sector. Why am I saying this? By looking at the Swedish energy sector today, you see a lot of new companies. Obviously, we have now a inc huge increase in wind power, energy efficiency, even now and then company or two in the solar power sector mm -hmm. and because we have uh, very successful uh, research on, on solar power in Sweden even though the sun is a bit absent most of the year and what I can see that most of those company you have much more women involved so, so you think there's a correlation then? Uh, there is obviously a, an empiric evidence there but I I think I, I would from my point of view, I would not expect that, that uh, how should I uh, say this? When I was, and I, when I was, uh, when I was uh, appointed minister for school, Leif uh, was my colleague at the time, was minister for education at the time. I got the question, and that was what it was said. It was not true, but it was said, this, the first immigrant in the Swedish government. 
how will Swedish policy now change with you in government? Because you, with your experience, you should have how that. And I, my counter question was, why should I have a broader responsibility than just being the minister for schools? So I'm, I'm obviously a bit allergic that, to, to these kind of stereotypes. Yes. I am. But it, it's difficult to not see a correlation here. You, you, you wouldn't say it's just that it's more common social thinking and that perhaps being pushed by environmental need or more open policy or, or just more work being done in that direction, that there's more of a thinking in that direction, regardless of who, what the gender is of your panel. Maybe, maybe, but I, I, obviously I, we have, until recently, all, all, this is from the Swedish point of view. Mm -hmm. Almost all of our, all of our, all of our uh, policy d debate has been about nuclear, uh, big centralized systems. And I, until recently, and I, I, I tend to see that this, has, this is about to change, both of, of course because of technological development, but I would say also because we have a broader experience in the sector now, because we have both men and women both young and, 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 and maybe more experienced people in it. And so even though I am a bit allergic to this myself, I, I tend to see that there is a correlation here. I, I okay. would obviously, obviously say that. Thank you. Thank you. We're running, almost running out of time. I wanted to ask you about two of the countries that you mentioned that you mm. visited. Um, and the first is Iran. What, mm. what, uh, what was your trip there? What was your dialogue? And what's your assessment of what's going on in Iran today? It was uh, post the, the Iran uh, the agreement, the mm -hmm. nuclear agreement, and um, it was also uh, obviously about uh, cooperation in the energy sector. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, Sweden and Iran, before the revolution, had uh, had a lot of trade and, and cooperation. Almost all of the uh, the grid in Iran is built by Swedish companies in the 70s. Uh, so we obviously have uh, a history there. And Iran is a growing country, very young population. Two thirds, I think, is under 30 or 35 or something like that. So it was how, how can we, see, how can we uh, promote a cooperation where you make the energy sector much more uh, sustainable? A big, bit ironic because they are one of the world's biggest exporters of oil uh, and, and fossil fuels. But th I think still it has, to, it has to be done. So that was uh, one, one of the, the things that, that uh, I was doing. And I'll, I must also confess, I was very curious about that country. I mean, so far from Sweden that you can almost get in culture and in gender equality and, 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 and other aspects. Um, Sweden is a very secular, we try to be. I, we don't. Uh, we, we. I cannot say that we succeed always, but we try to be in, in, in a, a society uh, uh, where equality and gender equality is, is, is at the forefront. Uh, where Iran has quite the opposite. I mean, it has been. A, it is a, a country where religion has plays a very big role. A very conservative uh, country. So I was also a bit a bit intrigued by the country. And I think I heard you right that you mentioned you visited Turkey also. Yep. And, and I wonder, how were you received, first as a Turkish emigre? And, and there have been some d developments in Turkey in terms of political liberties and other developments in the past uh, months. Any, any comments on those? First off, it was very strange because it was my, the first time in 35 years, my second time in Istanbul. The first time oh. I was moving to, uh, to Sweden. Uh, and coming from a, from a small village in the southeast part of Turkey, going all over the country, coming to Istanbul, mega city all, already at the time, it was like a uh, boy just awed by everything. Mm -hmm. And now, 35 years later, going back to headline a conference on smart cities. It was a bit of an irony, I would say, but that, that's life tends to, to, to pull your leg sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was I was ve very well received. I had very good meetings. Uh, I was uh, it was a very interesting conference, of course, because these mega cities, be if it's New York or 
or Istanbul or Beijing or Delhi, they have huge, huge challenges when it comes to water quality, air quality, providing citizens with, with everything they need everyday life without destroying the environment. I mean, a city like New York with have more population than Sweden has as, as a total. Uh, so obviously there are challenges. The same for, goes for Istanbul. It was two and a half months before another a coup attempt. Mm -hmm. It was in April last year. I must say that I am very saddened by the development in Turkey. My parents moved there uh, in the beginning of the 90s because of uh, the lack of, uh, of, of, of a future there. My father, we were peasants, we were farmers. We had, we, uh, we had, uh, we, we lived off the land, so to say. We, 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 we produced everything that we, that we, we lived off, so, so to, to speak. And there is, of course, that, that's a very poor life, but there is also pride in that. So my father had promised that never to leave, because in the 60s and 70s, your northern, northern European countries like Germany, Sweden, and others were uh, were on on on, on they were uh, drafting a lot of, of people from uh, Italy, Turkey, and other Greece because they they needed uh, labor, lots and lots of it. So we had my uncle, um, a couple of uncles went to Germany and Sweden and so on. But my father promised he would never leave. But in the beginning of the 1980s, the situation became very dire. You had, all, you had the military coup. You had the, 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 uh, the Kurdish uh, liberation uh, movement going on. And the situation became very dire because you, whoever won the last fight, we were, as a small ethnical and religious minority, we were always the losers. And my father was in the, in the, in the risk of being a volunteer in the army or the opposite. Mm. So, and that wasn't, wasn't any good situation. So in the end, we were forced to, to move. Mm. And for a very long time, the situation didn't become any, any better. But then 15 years ago, something started to happen. The country began to take another path democratically, but also in, in everyday life. My old village got electricity, roads, a school, hospital, it was like, wow, what is happening? Mm. You could even see them on the internet. That was very strange, I must confess. Even the old monastery where I was, where I was studying when I was six, seven years, because my brilliant career as a goat herder came to an end when I, I couldn't cope with it. It turned out that I, had, uh, uh, I was born with a heart, heart condition. And having a heart condition, chasing goats, in the Turkish mountains in summertime with 40, 40 degrees Celsius, no good combination there, you know. So I was, I was actually sent to the, to the local monastery. And so seeing that on the internet was, was fabulous. But for the recent years, the Turkey has taken another direction. And I'm saddened by it because it's like they're going in circles. Decade after decade going in circus, and that is very, very, from my point of view, very, very saddening. Because I have I've had a dream that Turkey one day would, will become a democratic member of the European Union, where we could freely go visit or live or whatever. But I cannot see that happen anymore, and that, that saddens me, unfortunately. Right, la last question, and then I've got a final question, we'll wrap up. Continue with Turkish. <laughs> I'm Turkish. Mm, nice. So I would like to ask about the Turkey's uh, position in terms of the European energy security. So there, uh, there are two pipelines that Turkey is dealing with. The Tanaptap, the first one uh, mm. in, uh, with European Union, and the second one is the Turk Stream or South Stream with mm. Russia. They look like uh, they are in contradiction with each other in terms of European energy security. What do you say about that? I was just uh, uh, talking about that uh, earlier. I think the, 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 the major principle in the, in the European cooperation is that every country should decide upon own, its own mix of energy. So if a country wishes to have 100% gas or coal or coal or oil or whatever, it is possible in theory. In practice, we have a cooperation where we'll also have obligations to, towards each other. 
One of those obligations is to reduce greenhouse gases. We have agreed in the European Union that should, that should be done. We want Europe together, we want Europe to be in the forefront and the lead the, 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 the transition to a more sustainable way of, 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 uh, of providing for our citizens and our industries. So obviously, energy comes into the, the cooperation. And from my point of view, I, I think the, 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 the future is in the renewable sector. I think that is what the European uh, Union should promote. And I think and this is also what is actually happening. And I think uh, that in the long run, that will make South Stream, North Stream, or whatever stream it is, unnecessary. That is what I'm hoping for, mm -hmm. with a combination of renewables and energy efficiency. I think Europe, European economy would flourish and, and be able to provide uh, the, uh, our citizens what we, whatever need we need. We would all obviously be cooperating much more than we are to today, building more interconnections, but we are, we are, we will, I, I think that will be the direction. So in the long run, I don't think we will need all these uh, streams from here and there. And my, my final question is actually not on energy, but I'm, I'm a student of languages, and I've been reading a lot about language acquisition lately, and so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious. Your, your English is absolutely fluent. I presume your Swedish is absolutely fluent, too, although I wouldn't be uh, in a position I'm to start, judge I'm that. I'm starting to learn now. Uh, yeah. Uh, just try, uh, yeah. And I'm curious, when you uh, arrived in Sweden at age 10, did you speak either English or Swedish, and, and how, was the, how was it to learn both those languages at age 10? Actually, at the time, when I came to Sweden, I was bilingual, but the languages I spoke was well, as far as you can come from Swedish or English, for, for that matter. I spoke my native tongue, my mother, mother tongue is uh, Aramaic, uh -huh. Syriac, Biblical Aramaic. Uh -huh. Not used that much anymore, right. except, except in, 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 in monasteries. And we have a small community in New Jersey of all places here in the world. Really? Yeah, and in Chicago. Um, and the other was uh, a Kurdish uh, dialect called Kurmanji. Unfortunately, I have more or less forgotten it because I haven't been using it oh. for, for 30 plus years. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but then, so Turkish wasn't spoken in your village? No, not much. And since I was very weak as a, as a child, I never went to Turkish school because uh, a school at the time where they had only one uh, method for learning and it was uh, the hard. It was like a uh, very hard uh, environment. So my parents never sent me to, to Turkish school and so I never learned. Unfortunately, I would say I never learned Turkish. I would love to uh, be able to, to speak Turkish. Uh, so uh, that was the language I spoke. And, and, mm -hmm. and so my first meeting with Swedish, and the Swedes here should close their ears at now, it sounded like Turkish talking. I mean, Turkish like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, what are they saying? But uh, you know, as a child, you, uh, even though I was 10 years old, and in the beginning it was difficult, you tend to, to learn, and I think the, 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 the fact that I had a heart condition and was hospitalized for a time helped me learn Swedish because all people around me talked Swedish. Oh. So uh, that was, I think, in, in its, I didn't think about it at the time, but it was a help. And, and then at the same time, the Swedish school system, you also uh, start with English at the same time. And beginning with Swedish and English at the same time was a bit difficult, but. As a child, you can cope with that, and um, so I would say that today, as a minister, I could both read and write Swedish fluently. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> well, it's a help, you know. Uh, minister, uh, thank you for, for your insights on energy and climate change and for your leadership in Sweden and the world, and thank you for joining us here at Columbia. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.